Welcome to Healthy University, where we'll discuss issues and subjects on how you can live a healthier and more productive life. And now, here's your host for Healthy University, Alan Eisenberg. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Healthy U. This is your host, Alan Eisenberg. And today we're going to talk about PTSD. And you might think that that is something that is only in the military uh, because that's certainly uh, the context around where you hear it a lot. But PTSD has actually uh, been diagnosed uh, for many people. And my guest today uh, had the diagnosis as well and is going to talk openly about it and, and how she was affected by it and, and things that we can do. Um, I talk about the fact I had CPTSD, which we may be talking about the same thing, um, which is just another term for having it at a younger age or in different circumstances. So my guest today is Davina Lytle. She's a survivor and an advocate for, of mental illness. She was diagnosed in 2005 with post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, and has since become a freelance writer and blogger. She's in the process of writing a book called I'm Still Here, A Survivor's Guide for Living with PTSD, as well as writing a weekly blog chronicling what it's like to live with a mental injury. So welcome to the show, Davina. Thanks, Alan. Nice to be here. Thanks for asking me. You know, as I read your opening, it really struck me that you use at the very end mental injury. And you don't hear that very often. And I, I like to talk about... Um, even my own case or many cases as an injury because when I broke my foot during my time of dealing with PTSD or CPTSD it was I realized it was the exact same procedure to get better yes so it was eight weeks of having to take medication that wasn't going to work right away to ease the pain and get that right and then mm -hmm. after that and the cast comes off, then I had to go through therapy and get my foot working again. And then even then there were still things, you know, that I still have scars and, and all that. And I thought, isn't that interesting? That's the exact same time frame I was dealing with with my mental injury. So how did you come up with mental injury? Um, I think just through all the research that I've done, um, it, 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 it kind of gets me... Um, like people using mental health instead of mental illness right. and mental illness instead of mental injury. When it, when it comes to PTSD, it's a brain injury. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's nothing like, um, you know, you can't take antidepressants to, to help with PTSD because it's an injury. It's not a chemical imbalance. Your, your, your brain, the shape of your brain changes forever. Mm. So, so it, it really is an injury. Yeah. See, and that's really interesting. Uh, how you bring that up and I think people don't realize that that actually things change you know whether it's whether it's chemically physically physiologically there are there are so many different things that could be changed you know and it, it I always tell people I say you know the the medicine aspect of mental health is only to get you in a stable place to be able to work on getting yourself better but it's really not there. There is no magic cure pill. <laughs> There's like nothing. No. Nothing Don't there. you wish there was though? Uh, wouldn't it be great? Yeah. <laughs> but but so when when were you diagnosed with PTSD, and, and what do you understand now that that caused it to happen? Well, I think what you what you started out saying about CPTSD. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, like I've heard that diagnosis before, and and that would. That would absolutely be me as well because my my post traumatic stress disorder. I mean, my my I I kind of remember my first trauma around the age of three, um, and then it just you know it was it was child abuse and and then I actually I actually had concussion twice and I was hospitalized. So I mean, I did have the the TBI as well, um, but I. I wasn't allowed to talk about it to anybody, and I kind of buried it until I got held up at work in 2005, and that's, that is when I realized that I had been burying most of my life, and, and uh, you know, my, my, my daughters, who are both, um, they're, they're mothers now, they're adults themselves, um, they'll tell you that it was difficult 
Yeah. Uh, there's things I just thought were my norm, like them not being able to come into me uh, in the middle of the night when they had a nightmare because I my hypervigilance would scare them more than their nightmares scared them. Oh, so yeah. oh yeah. So yeah, it's it's been there. It's been there for for most of my life, but I didn't get the diagnosis until almost th- 13 years ago. Yeah, I mean, I was I was in my 40s. <laughs> you know, it was like it was it was it was like I had lived this whole period of time and it's interesting you use the word bury because my first book is called A Ladder in the Dark because I tried to bury these memories, but you obviously we can't, you know. Mm-hmm. They don't they don't ever disappear uh, and they become a part of our What's sitting in the back, what I say, is our subconscious living. So, you know, we're bringing them with us every day. We just don't realize it. Um, and and I think that that's, you know, it, it does sound like you fit into that CPTSD com- or what's, what's called complex because yeah. of the abuse early. And then the same thing happened to me. You know, we, what, what people don't understand is, is there ends up being a trigger. So we, yeah. do, we do have, you know... Even even as I wrote my book, I explained, you know, I, sp- I spent years wearing masks and faking it and doing all these things and not being my authentic self. And then it, I had a trigger. I got fired from a job and, and that it was a friend who did it, I was working for and it just brought all that back. And yeah. It just boom. And that was it. And 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 so that's what people don't realize is is that there are, there is a triggering mechanism, right? Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, going back to you, you being held up, why do you think that that was the trigger for you? Um, I think, and yeah, I thought about it a lot. I think that it was because a perfect stranger threatened my life. Do you know what I mean? Somebody that didn't know me from Adam, somebody that didn't know what kind of a person that I am. And honestly, I'm... I'm an empath, you know, I put other people before me. Um, I'm, I'm sure that's comes from the abuse and, and, and trying to please, you know, my abusers and stuff. But, um, I really think that's what it was. It was, yeah, this person, this person was angry and, and didn't even think about who they were taking their anger out on. And, and it just, it, it, it's a trust thing. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? No, yeah, I uh, totally get it. Totally um, understand how how that plays a major part in uh, in things happening like this. You know, where you know just something reminds you of the past. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's this feeling um, that jumps out at you, and I know for me that's that's what it was. Um, so, so I know that you also talk about that you went most of your life without sort of a diagnosis of PTSD and then finally it was, so what, so you had this incident and then, and then what happened, what led to getting to the diagnosis? Well, cause it happened at work. They forced me to go to, um, to therapy and it was pretty intense. Um, I mean, the first the, in the first year, uh, I think I was going two or three times a week and uh, trying to do CBT, which just I for me. And there are studies now um, stating that for some people, CBT, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy makes PTSD worse for some people. And I was one of those people. And um, and I went from. I went from being out there, you know, I would go dancing with my friends on a Friday. I wasn't scared of anything to, um, a year after being diagnosed, not even leaving my house. Yep. Um, I had my, my groceries bought in. Um, uh, if my, my boyfriend, he's now my husband, couldn't pick things up, but I, I, I stopped. I couldn't leave the house. I was absolutely terrified of the outside world. Yeah. Oh. I've been been there, done it, and it, it's uh, <laughs> you know I I have a weird story and I tell it quite a bit because it's so weird um, that I started having panic attacks, which is really what we're talking about. You know, you walk out the house, you you start having a panic attack or fight, flight, or fr- or freeze, yeah. and um, I was having it when I was on in the barber's chair and they put the 
you know, smock around me because I yeah. felt like I was trapped, right? You know, I was having these feelings yeah. of being trapped. And I thought, God, you know, I'm totally crazy. Totally crazy. Yeah, you know, I'm just like, uh, I can't even get a haircut. <laughs> you know, I'm just, I'm, <laughs> you know, and I think we think that, right? That's just a natural thing. Like, I must be the only person. And, and I'm also a huge self-studier, so I was buying books at the time about anxiety and, and things like that. And, and one of the books right in it, you know, it said, some people even have anxiety attacks when they're sitting in a barber's chair. And <laughs> I'm like, I'm just one of, you know, the, the millions that has these things happen to them. So, yeah. so it, it's funny that we're not as special as we think, you know, the thing, the, the sad, the sad part is when we, we get trapped and we get no way out. So mm-hmm. I've known people who like, like you're saying, get stuck in their house and don't fight to get out. Yeah. And that's it, you know. And you have to do it really slowly. And it's funny, Alan, because when I first um, when I first decided I was going to write a book and, and, and get myself out there on Twitter, um, I met uh, a, a, a girl. Um, and we've actually met each other. She lives in the same province as I do. Um, but we would talk to each other, we would text each other and, and, and one of my goals was to just get outside and sit on the front step for five minutes. That's all that mm-hmm. my goal was at the beginning. And, and she, she's been watching me and my progress. And now the fact that, you know, I, I've got a service dog and I, and I do get out. Um, I, lately I haven't been getting out every day, but, um, yeah, it was five minutes just sitting on the front step for a little while and then it got to 10 minutes and then it's okay. Now go around the back of the house and, um, you know, you've, you've, you've got to, you've got to work on it. You can't just give into it. Mm -hmm. Um, but I have to say there are days when, when I cut myself slack, you know, if I'm having a really bad day and I've set a goal, if I can't do it that day, then that's okay. Right. You know, back at her tomorrow, but, uh, cause you have to be kind to yourself. Yeah. If you're, you're feeling like you're going to be triggered then be nice or sometimes you just need to rest i mean sometimes your body just tells you and you know that that's the thing is is i think our fear is we you know once we're in these things that we're going to fall back but allowing yeah. yourself to have one day in bed you know like i'm just going to lay in bed and knowing that you're not going to do it twice you know uh, yeah. and that's that's the key is that you know you're you're allowed to do things that other people can do, right? You know, you just can't become that same thing. And I always tell people, I'm sure you, you probably have the same line I do, you know, when are you going to be better? And I say, you know, when, when I'm in the grave, you know, when I'm done, yeah. when I'm done, I'll be better. Um, I don't, I don't look at life that way anymore. I don't, you know, predict tomorrow and try to play that game. You know, say it'll never happen yeah. again, or um, you know, I can't fall back. All of these things are real, right? You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you said something really interesting, and it just leads me on where you said you're an empath, and and I say that a lot too. You know, I'm very empathetic. I I have very good instincts about people, and I always tell people mm-hmm. it's not mind reading; it's emotion reading or energy reading or. Uh, knowing that someone, in, you know, just inherently knowing that this person and, and you aren't going to get along and, you know, first mm-hmm. impression type stuff. But there's other interesting things that I've found that I'm, I'm curious about you, which is being highly sensitive. Like one of the things I realized is the reason that things affected me so much when I was young was because I have a very high sensitivity which comes with empathy, which comes with sort of being an empath. Um, do you find that? Do you, have you, has anyone ever talked to you about high, high, being highly sensitive? Absolutely. And, and since, since I started writing my book, I, all the research and stuff that I've done, um, there's certain things that are the same with a lot of people that have PTSD. One of the things, especially, um, to our degree, uh, one of the things that kind of ties us all together is most of us have been abused as a child. You know, there are people that have been in accidents as a, uh, an adult. And actually, I have a, a friend who is, um, he was in the military, and then when he came home, he became a cop. And his brother also did the same thing. They come from a family of, um, you know, military. And, and 
and his brother is completely fine but he himself is not but the difference between the two of them is he was abused as a child mm. he was sexually abused yeah. by a family member but um and and i think as well um we are extremely extremely intelligent people we're overthinkers yep. and i also think that we are all very sensitive that we are all empaths and i think that if we weren't that way then we probably wouldn't have PTSD. If we could just yeah. walk through life like a lot of people do, you know, just worrying about what's ahead of them instead of worrying about anybody around them. And yeah, uh, that's not me. I, I I care more for other people than I do myself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I don't know how to do that. And what you mentioned earlier about, you know, taking time for yourself. I actually wrote a blog this week um, that I need to take some time. My health is kind of... I'm, I'm seeing a specialist next week, but my health is suffering a little bit. Um, and we've been we've been moving. We're we're trying to build a house, and for me, to cut myself some slack and and not be the people that are sending me emails and stuff saying that they need to desperately talk to somebody. Oh, it's so hard. Yeah. So one of the things that's really I think you know critical that that's interesting about complex ptsd is is it does lump in a whole bunch of people like concentration camp survivors are in there along with mm -hmm. abuse survivors and bullying survivors and and i think it's it's because it's a much bigger classification and that that sensitivity to the situation i think you're totally right on i mean i i just think a hundred percent if i could just not worry about what anyone thought, you know, <laughs> just go through <laughs> life like it's all about me. But one of the things I tell uh, a lot of people is, have you ever taken yourself out on a date? How do you show up? You know, and it's it's kind of like what you're saying is you got to you got to go do things by yourself sometimes and find out who you are. I think a lot of us just don't have any idea who we are. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. we spend a lot, especially those of us that worry about others as we spend so much time worrying about how others feel about us we don't even focus on how we feel about ourselves or if we do it's not usually in the positive so so we have to take a quick break but when we come back okay. uh i'd love to talk about maybe how you work through your symptoms and uh what you're doing with your book okay okay awesome all right this is alan eisenberg with healthy you uh please hold on and we'll be right back You're listening to Healthy University with Alan Eisenberg. Hi, and welcome back to Healthy You. This is your host, Alan Eisenberg, and I'm here today with Davina Lytle, and she's a survivor and advocate for mental illness, and particularly PTSD, and is working on a book and, and writes a blog on the subject. So welcome back, Davina. Hi. Thanks, Alan. So when, when we let, last left off, we were talking about sort of how you've dealt with it. So, so when, 
when you sort of really discovered you had PTSD, what was your first reaction to t telling others? Because obviously you're open now, and, and I know for me it took a long time to get to the point of saying, "Hey, you know, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to others about this." Mm -hmm. When did you get to a point where you felt it was safe to talk to others about it, or how did your your family react when you first told them? So, yeah, my family didn't react very well at all. And even up until uh, just over a year ago, I got the last um, threatening email saying that if I didn't stop talking about it, that um, that they were going to make me stop. Um, I uh, the my family of origin um, told even my my daughters that. From a very young age, I, I was sick. I had Munchausen syndrome, and I don't know if you know what that is or yeah, not, yeah. but it's – so that's what they told everybody. Like, so that when I tried to talk about the abuse, when I tried to tell people what was going on, um, they had discredited me. So nobody believed what I said. Yeah, and, and I, know, so, I know what you're talking about, but, but it's a good thing to explain, I think, to others – so, yeah. So explain that a little bit. Explain. So that Munchausen syndrome is you make up illnesses. So you're telling people that, you know, and and honestly, I'm a, a very clumsy person. I don't know whether it's because a lot of the time I'm stuck in my head, but I I've had a lot of injuries. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, torn rotator cuffs, ACLs, broken fingers, broken toes, uh, sprains, you name it. So, but they would just say that. The, I was just making that up, that I really didn't hurt myself. Mm. And, yeah, that, that's funny you say that because, like I said, when I was in the midst of all my stuff, you know, I, I, I actually dropped a boat lift on my foot. Um, Ow. And, and I think it's because we're not folk. We're not, you know, our minds are, are so fogged up. You know, we're just, yes. we're not paying attention um, yeah. to what's going on around us. And, and we yeah. have accidents. Um, yeah. So... So that was really like a little bit of uh, bullying, you know, from from your family, you know. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, and 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 right after that happened, then they 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 deleted and blocked both my girls, my daughters, and um, my nephew, and and told them they didn't want to talk to them anymore. Um, and <sighs> that's so frustrating. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And but when when my oldest daughter, she was so close to them. Um, when I, I sent her a whole bunch of emails from, from them, co uh, conversations had gone back and forth between the two of us or all of us so that she could see my side right. because she'd already been told their side. And she was the one who confirmed that that's, she, she said, honestly, mom, she said, I'm embarrassed. She, she said, because I even, I laughed with them. We would say that you had Munchausen's that you made everything up. And she said, and then everybody would laugh. So. But what I, I started doing three years ago when I decided I wanted to write the book, um, I distanced myself from the people, places, and things that exacerbated my symptoms, mm -hmm. and that meant my family of origin. Yeah. I could not be around them um, because I knew. I knew something was up, but I didn't know exactly what it was, and it was such a trigger. A family get-together or whatever was such a trigger for me. So, like I say, I distanced myself from all the things that exacerbated my, my symptoms, and and then I just I started writing about it. Yeah. And that's when I started my blog. And I found writing about it, and uh, I think it was probably in the first month I got an email from. It was a, f a friend of friends of mine uh, who had seen my blog, and she wrote me an email and said that she was contemplating suicide and that she'd read my blog. And found that she was not the only person feeling that way, and that basically I had saved her life. And it from there, it just, oh, you know, to go through all the abuse, to have, live this live this way, and um, and find a purpose. Oh my goodness, it was like, and, and now, like I say, I can't even stop. I, I can't even take the time for mm. myself because it's just, I feel like okay, I'm finally helping somebody now. Yeah, there. I think I think the same thing happens to all of us who decide we're going to be activists in the mental health world, in particularly, where you know you you're just really it just takes one person to tell you 
that you saved them or you you know you you did a, some you know whatever it is that yeah. that you know I, I wrote this article for one of the one of the uh, blog blog sites and it was just about how I'm a male but I'm highly sensitive and empathic and I'm an introverted extrovert so it's really about <laughs> being careful to label label people but I said yeah I don't like sports you know I like a good conversation about feelings because mm -hmm. of the empath empathic part you know I'm so so people come up to me and you know or start asking me if I'm gay and I don't mean that as an insult it's just the way they think like oh well you know you're not a guy's guy you must be yeah. you know something else and and I'm always like no I'm allowed to be this way <laughs> this is who I am and it you know it took me a long time to get to the point of like you know I could talk about sports sure but that's not that's not my passion it's not what I love and and so I I tend to attract and I don't mean this, you know, physically, but like women, you know, women look, I can sit around and have a conversation with a bunch of women because they're willing to talk about their feelings. Mm -hmm. Men usually aren't. But after I wrote this article, I had all these guys go, thank you so much. You know, I'm, I couldn't <laughs> put it into words. And, I, and I, I'm now sending this to all my friends and my wife. And, you know, because it's very hard to explain and it doesn't feel right. And so for everyone else out there, they think they're alone, like. I'm the only one. And then it just takes one person to say, this is what I'm going through. And then they go, yeah. I'm not alone. So like I said, yeah. I'm reading a book and it says, yeah, people have anxiety attacks in barber's chairs. And I'm like, what a relief that was. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. So, so let's, let's get into sort of our, our self care because I think it's important that people know there is self care. There is a way out. Would I say a way out of the trap? Um, or the or the the holes we dig for ourselves. Um, so what do you, what kinds of stuff do you do to help you feel better now or, or deal with the symptoms of PTSD? The biggest thing is to cut yourself some slack um, when you're feeling. Uh, I'm, I call them pity parties. When I'm having a really really bad day, I allow myself to have that pity party, and then it's back at her the next day. You know, I I. I don't try to push through it as much as I used to. Um, there's certain things. Music, I always have music going. Um, I think for me, yeah, I don't know what it is about music. Uh, especially late at night, I will turn on YouTube and mm -hmm. videos and I dance mm -hmm. and crank the music. And it's one of those things that helps me shut down my brain so I can go to sleep. So let me, let like me ask this. you an interesting question because this is an article that I just read. Okay. Do you hear a song that you haven't heard for a while and get goosebumps? Oh yeah! Oh my goodness! <laughs> That's yeah. So you have this. It's it's this again. This highly high sensitivity. Um, music for me. I mean, I tell people all the time: music, movies, media. I was a big comic book person as a kid, and I look back at them, and I can tell you when I bought them, where I was. Mm -hmm. I could tell you when I heard this song. You know, I could play this game on TV where. I call it my little game that's not, never going to make me any money, but you know how on the TV it'll say the the year the song came out, the artist, and the album, and yeah. I can I cannot look, and if it's late seventies, early eighties, I can I can name them all, whether I like the that's song awesome. or not, be, because music meant that much to me, you know, it's just so goofy, but uh, but music is is really one of those triggers, good and bad. Yeah, you know, I remember I was, yeah. you know. I was listening to a, a Molly Hatchet song, if you know who Molly Hatchet is, you know, hard rock. And I was yeah. crying, like, why am I crying? And it was because <laughs> it was putting me in my mindset back at the time, you know, of my youth uh, yeah. at a bad time, probably. But, but yeah, music is known to be an incredibly powerful form um, of therapy. And, I, and yeah. I believe it 100%. I mean, I think it just affects us. And and as I tell people, I like songs, but the lyrics are what get me, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Yeah. Movies as well. You mentioned movies, mm -hmm. uh, but mostly musicals. I hmm. actually, um, I wore out Mamma Mia. <laughs> <laughs> you and my wife would get along really good. 
<laughs> oh yeah, I love Mamma Mia, Moulin Rouge is, is another yeah. one. And the good thing about it is you can you can get all those songs on YouTube. Oh yeah, yeah. Right? If you wanna Yeah, there's just certain songs that yeah. get in my head and then I go to sleep and I'm singing them in my head and it helps me to go to sleep. Yeah. Because my mind's on something different. Yeah. And and of course there's there's research now that proves, you know, certain certain tonalities affect the brain. So, you know, there's there's all this these uses for it. Um, any other mindful uh, activities, uh, meditation, yoga, any of that? Tai Chi, actually. Mm-hmm. I tried meditation, Alan. I tried and tried and tried, but I just I couldn't do it. I I can't I can't sit still. But the Tai Chi absolutely amazing because you're you, the only thing that you're thinking about is is what you're doing mm-hmm. so yeah i find tai chi really helpful i i i do uh, strength training because mm-hmm. um, i find exercise is something that is you know people don't realize i know a lot of people hate exercising but if they only if you could get through the first eight weeks <laughs> you know what yep, i mean yep. and then you'll never go back because it it is it is a really underused drug when it comes to depression and oh, anxiety yeah. and mental yeah. illness. If you work out, it it really will help to get you feeling better about yourself. I, I tell people I go to a gym and, and on the front door, I remember, you know, when I first decided I was going back, one, and I decided I was going to exercise to try to get past my own problems. And there was a note, there was a, a sign on the door I'd never seen before at the gym and it says, know that showing up was half the battle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so just getting there I'm was half the battle. And I'm like, oh, that's so true. And and then the endorphin effect, right? So the, the working out is, is the release of endorphins. Well, that's the same, to put it in a classification, as a drug, right? It, it's an immediate yeah. high to the brain. You know, you start doing cardio, you start working out. And this endorphin is released to the brain and automatically it's a happy signal and bam, you know, and, and so after a workout, you just feel like a million dollars. Plus you're a little tired and, you know, you've, yeah. you've gotten this energy, this expended energy out. Um, and then and then what what you were saying about Tai Chi or something is like yoga, you know, where you're you're there, you know, and e- either way, Tai Chi, you're there with yourself. Yoga, you're there with your mat. And a good yoga teacher will make that clear that, you know, you're not there doing it with everybody. You're there doing it with you. And, yeah. and it's just a, f- a focus thing. It's kind of like if, if meditation works, it's a focus thing. It's a, you know, you, need, you have to get to the point of being able to clear your mind. Now, not everybody can do any of these. You know, all of these are different, right, different, yeah. different abilities. Kind of like you said, CBT it do- doesn't work for some people. You know, you can't. Yeah can't lump everybody into the same class but i do think that i I say there's three things um you need to you need to exercise because that releases the endorphins Mm -hmm. you need to eat better eat right because serotonin is made in the gut Mm -hmm. so if you're not eating right you're not creating serotonin and therefore, that's the other major drug for the brain, right? Absolutely. And then finally, you need to um, do some form of gratitude journaling. or grat- You need to see every day as a positive. Read positive yeah. affirmations. I don't care what it is, but it's, it's easy to fall into the everything sucks. Every day sucks. Yeah. You know, we, that's where we get to. And you've got you to gotta do something to make sure that you don't do that. And those are, those are my three. I don't know if you have your own, but but those are my three. Yeah, well, no, the, the gratitude journal as well is, is – and, and when I talked earlier about that friend on Twitter, um, I wrote in, in the journal that I had. It was a five-minute journal or something, and it you had to write down three things, three things that you were grateful for, um, three things that could have made the day better, and I can't remember what else it was. But, but yeah, I do. I, I do a lot of journaling. Uh, I think it's really important to get your thoughts out of your head and onto mm-hmm. paper where they make sense because otherwise I just feel like they're like they're, it's like it's like a, a beehive and the bees are just buzzing around and bouncing off and driving you crazy yeah. literally yeah. but if you take that and you write out what is going on in your head 
then yeah, you can look at it and it just it just seems to make more sense. So coloring as well, Alan, is, oh, yeah. is something that I do. But then also you mentioned about eating and that was something uh, two years after I was diagnosed with PTSD, I ended up with uh, type 2 diabetes and um, I, I got rid of it. It took me a while, but um, I changed everything up. We got rid of um, processed foods. We don't eat anything unless it's non-GMO. Like it can't have any glyphosate because I feel glyphosate, uh, uh, it's the roundup or whatever. And unless you know about non-GMO, you don't really know about it. But I found that changing the way that I ate for sure um, and not eating processed foods and not eating takeout, everything is made from scratch. Um, that definitely helped me as well. Yeah, and it's hard. I mean, I, I admit it's it's that nutrition part is probably one of the most difficult. But again, it's mm-hmm. one of those things that you can say, hey, every once in a while, you know, I'm going to cheat it. But but trying to stay what we say to the outer aisles of the supermarket, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> where all the yeah. where all the good stuff is is yeah. something you you work on. So so I know you're you're working on your book. Um, any, any thoughts on when you're going to finish that? Well, you know, and I keep I keep going back to my first video and saying that it was going to be out, I think, in 2015 or late 2016 or something. And, and I'm still working on it. Now, I wrote, I started writing the guide and then kind of changed things up and decided I was going to write an autobiography and write about my life from beginning until where it was now. And that's when my family started saying that if I, if I did that, that they would sue me. And, um, uh, so I, I, I've shelved the autobiography. I had it edited and then I shelved it because of the threats and then started back at writing, uh, the survivor's guide. And my husband said to me the other day, he said, the reason why you haven't finished it is because you haven't finished. Hmm. You know, we, we, we have been living so different circumstances. My husband kind of got retired out early. Uh, we couldn't afford to stay in the house where we were because we got married late. We had a huge mortgage. Um, but up until July 27th of last year, which was the day that we moved, uh, we'd been living in the same place for eight years. I barely left the house. We had an alarm system, uh, which was always on. And, uh, and I live with the curtains closed, but selling the house and the delay in having the next one built, um, put us um, I, I wrote a blog about it, couch surfing. We've been living at different places, friends and family. And, and there have been places, let me tell you, there was one place that the back door didn't lock. And, um, if it would have been me five years ago, I wouldn't have been able to stay there. Yeah. You know, it, it moving all over the place and living in different places has done a huge part of healing for me. Yeah. You know, it's been really tough. It's been really stressful, but I mean, I, I'm, yeah, I, I never left the house. I didn't. Yeah. I, I just, it, uh, maybe once a month or something, I would go somewhere, but, but yeah, now doing this, living on the fly, so to speak, um, has really helped me to grow, and it's given me a lot more. Um, I don't know. I guess knowledge on how to deal with living with the PTSD. And that's why I say it, it's not finished because I'm not finished yet. Yeah. It's inter- it's interesting because, you know, it took me, I always tell people about 10 years, I, and I did write my autobiography, but w- they're always like, well, why did it take so long? I said, because I never had the third act. I never, I never had the recovery. And so without that, I didn't have, all I was doing was writing a book about getting bullied and how bad it was and there, yeah. there are a lot of those out there and and it said nothing of how i overcame it and and so i was you know that's when i needed to write it is when i finally had that story that part of the story so mm-hmm. it's always they come when they come you know that's what i always tell people yeah. like as, as writers you know if you're doing a blog or you're you're putting it out there you know keep keep doing the good work because you know pete you, you never know who's reading it until all of a sudden something crazy happens, like happened to me. You know, it's like all of a sudden the whole town that I was writing about, all the all the kids that were bullied in the town I was that I was bullied in, found my blog. 
And next thing I knew, it just blew up. It's like, what happened? <laughs> it's, I'm just sitting at home writing, you know. Um, so, so there's always good things. I like to ask all my yeah. all my guests one last question. Um, it's uh, not okay. not meant to be a surprise, but hopefully you have a good answer. So, what okay. is what is the one thing now that you are doing that you didn't do before to live a healthier life? Hmm. There's so much that's changed. Um, or what's your favorite one? <laughs> um, the biggest thing, and I think that once I've, I've done this completely, then I can really finish my book, and that is learning to accept myself. Because I, I was never, ever good enough for my parents or my family of origin. Um, so for so many years, I was never good enough for myself. And I'm really learning that I. Okay, I lost you. I accept again. myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, that's okay. So what did you? I so just I, learning you said to I was really, myself. I was, re- I'm really learning. So start with. So I'm really learning. I'm really learning to accept myself for who I am. Yeah. You no, know, and be proud of who I am instead of. I mean, I was, I was lazy. I was, I, I, I don't think, I don't remember hearing, I don't ever, uh, ever good enough. Yeah. That has been the biggest thing for me is accepting myself for who I am and saying, yeah, you are okay. They just had bad judgment. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and that's the voice in our head. You know, it, it's, as I say, you know, my bullying ended a long time ago. Then I started bullying myself. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. and, and I became the bully. It was me telling, telling me that I was a bit, I was, I wasn't good and all, you know, because they weren't around anymore. That was over. So, so it's an interesting thing that we go through. So that's a great one. Um, I think, I think, what, what we call it, our living our authentic self. This is who we are and coming in every day yes. as who we are instead of trying to put on a mask for somebody else is, yeah. is the most powerful thing that we can do for ourselves because it's painful. It's painful otherwise. Um, it is. And so, so I, I just want to thank you for being on the show. It, what oh, what you're, you're doing, on. you're doing, you know, you're doing great work. It's, you know, it's, it's important that people know that they're not alone, that, you know, it, it, there's so many of us, you know, if I've learned nothing else over, over time, there are so many of us dealing with um, the long-term effects of things that happen to us and, and how it works. Yeah. So how, how can people uh, learn more about you or, or get in touch with you? Um, you can follow me on Twitter under Davina Lytle. Um, I have a blog. And that as well is just www.davinalytle.com. And I also have a Facebook page uh, called I'm Still Here. Okay. And I will have all those links with the podcast. So, so Awesome. Thank you so much, Alan. Thank you. And thanks for being on the show and being another strong advocate for, You're welcome. for people who are dealing with what, we, what, we, what you said at the beginning, mental, oh. mental in, uh, injury. So, so yeah. important. So thanks so much, Davina. You're welcome, Alan. Thank you so much for what you do. Thanks. And this is Alan Eisenberg with Healthy You. Please join us next time. Thank you for listening to Healthy University, brought to you by Bullying Recovery, LLC. This podcast does not replace the need for medical advice, professional diagnosis, opinion, treatment, or services to you or any other individual. The information provided here or through linkages to other sites is not a substitute for medical or professional care, and you should not use the information in place of a visit, call, consultation, or the advice of your physician or other health care provider. Join us next time for more Healthy University.